Thank you for joining us on the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, because obedience is better than sacrifice, teach us to joyfully obey you uh, through your word today. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Our text for today is found in 1 John chapter 5, verse 1 through 3, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. That's 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, with emphasis on verse 3. Verse 1 says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. And by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and, this, and his commandments are not burdensome or, or grievous. Uh, that's our uh, text for today. Our subject is perfected love builds joyful obedience. Perfected love builds joyful obedience. So we might not be there yet, but we are on the way because God continues through his Holy Spirit to work up or work in us to perfect his love in us for him and for one another, and therefore our obedience will become more and more joyful. Now, we're not talking about simply obedience, but joyful obedience. God's commandments are not burdensome, and everything in creation except man obeys the will of God. Fire, hail, snow, vapors, uh, stormy winds, uh, all fulfill his word. But we are like Jonah in the book of Jonah. Uh, you see how the wind and the waves and even the biggest of fish obeyed God's command. But the prophet kept disobeying. Even a plant and a little worm did what God commanded them to do. But the prophet stubborn, stubbornly uh, wanted his own way. Isn't that much like us in this day and age? We so often want our own way like little children in everything, all the time. Disobedience to God's will is a tragedy, but so is uh, lukewarm, complaining obedience. God does not want us to uh, disobey him, but neither does he want us to uh, obey out of fear or necessity. What Paul wrote about giving, uh, 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 what he wrote about in the principle of giving also applies in living. God does not want us to give grudgingly. He does not want us to live obedient lives grudgingly or under pressure, for God loves a cheerful giver, as stated in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, rather, chapter 9, verse 7. So what is the secret of joyful obedience? It is to recognize that obedience is a family matter. If we want to really uh, learn the secret of joyful obedience. It starts with recognizing that obedience is a family matter. That's where we first learn to obey in our home uh, uh, households as children, obeying our parents. We are serving a loving father and helping our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we have been born of God and we love God, and we love God's children. And we demonstrate this by keeping God's commandments. Jesus said, uh, obey my commandments, and by this all men will know that you are my disciples, 
everybody will know who we are and whose we are if we obey God's word. There's a story of a woman visiting a newspaper editor. Uh, she stopped by his office and she's hoping to sell him some of her poems that she had written. The editor uh, asked her, what are your poems about? She told him, they are about love. And the editor settled back in his chair and said, well, read me a poem. The world could certainly use a lot more love, he tells her. Now, the poem she read was filled with moons and junes and other steamy thoughts. And it was more than the editor could take. So he told her, I I'm sorry, but you just don't know what love is all about. It's not about moons and moonlight uh, and roses. It's something uh, that, like sitting up all night at a sick bed or giving uh, yourself to work extra hours so that your child can have food on the table or new shoes. That's what love is all about, he tells us. The world doesn't need your brand of poetical love. It needs some good old-fashioned practical love. And that's what the world needs today. D.L. Moody of Moody Press often said, every Bible should be bound in shoe leather. And we should show our love to God, not by empty words, but by willing works. We are not slaves obeying a master. We are children obeying a father. And our sin also is a family matter. One of the tests of maturing love is our personal attitude towards the Bible, because the Bible is where we find God's will for our lives being revealed. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, uh, an unsaved person considers the Bible an impossible book mostly because he or she does not understand its spiritual message. An immature Christian considers the demands of the Bible to be bur burdensome. They are all, uh, to a certain extent, like a little child who is learning to obey and who asks, why do I have to do that? Or wouldn't it be better to do this? But a Christian who experiences God's perfecting love, finds themselves enjoying the word of God and truly loving it. We do not read the Bible as a textbook, but as a love letter. The longest number in the Bible in Psalms is Psalms 119. And as a matter of fact, I think that's the, that's the longest uh, of all of the chapters even. Psalms is uh, recognized by numbers and not chapters. Uh, but Psalms 119 is the longest of the numbers in Psalms and of chapters in the book. And its theme is the word of God. Every verse but two in Psalms, 100, in, in the book of Psalms, but uh, let's see, verse 122 and 132 in the uh, 190 number of Psalms mentions the word of God in one form or another as a law or a precept or a commandment. But the interesting thing is that the psalmist loves the word of God and enjoys telling us about it. He says in Psalms 119, verse, seven, verse 97, Oh, how I love thy law. And then in verses 14 and 162, he says that he rejoices in the law of God. And then in verse uh, 16 and 24, he reminds us that he delights in the word of God. Now, it's, it is uh, honey to his taste in verse 103. And in fact, he turns to God's law 
and turns it into a song. He says, thy statues have been my song in the house of my pilgrimage. Psalms 50, Psalm 119, verse 54. Now, imagine turning statues into songs. Suppose that the Memphis Symphony presented a concert of the traffic codes that have been set to music. Most of us do not consider laws or uh, as a source of joyful song. But this is the way the psalmist looked at God's law, at God's word, as, at God's commandments. And because he loved the Lord, he loved God's law. God's commandments were not grievous and burdensome to the psalmist, and we should be growing to realize that the word of God is not grievous or burdensome to us. Even though we act like God's word is difficult and bur uh, burdensome to, 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 to obey, it's really not. God's word is easier to obey. And it's easier to obey God's word than it is to disobey God's word. It's like smiling and frowning. It takes a lot more to frown than it does to smile. Grievous means painful, afflictive, or hard to bear, offensive, or harmful. And burdensome means something that will wear you out, fatigue. It's, it will oppress you. It's heavy. It'll wear, wear you down, weight you down. Uh, it, it's an oppressive weight. It's troublesome. But God's word is not like any of that. Just as a loving son or daughter happily obeys their father's command, so a Christian with perfecting uh, love joyfully obeys God's command. Now, at this point, we can uh, review and understand the practical meaning of maturing love in our daily lives. As our love for God matures, we have confidence and are no longer afraid of his will. When God's word is being perfected in us and building joyful obedience, we will also uh, notice honesty towards each other and lose our fear of being rejected by others or hurt by others. And we have a new attitude towards the word of God. It is the expression of God's love and we enjoy obeying it. Confidence towards God, honesty towards others, and joyful obedience are the making or and mark of perfecting love and the in ingredient that makes up a happy Christian life. It's not difficult to see how sin ruins all of this. When we disobey God, we lose our confidence towards him. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 19 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we do not quickly confess our sins and claim his forgiveness, we must start pretending in order to cover up our sins. Disobedience leads to dishonesty and both turns our hearts away from the word of God. And instead of reading the word with joy, we discover, uh, which is our way of discovering our father's will. Instead of uh, reading it with joy and discovering his will, we ignore the word and most likely read it in a routine way. The burden of religion is, in, in other words, uh, religion is a man trying to please God in his own strength. So a bur the burden of religion is grievous. It's a grievous, burdensome thing. Matthew 23, verse 2 through 4 says, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So practice 
and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do. For they preach, but do not practice. In other words, do what they say and not what they do. Verse 4 says, they tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders but they themselves will, are not willing to move them with a finger. But the yoke of Christ puts on us, uh, the, the yoke that Jesus Christ puts on us is not burdensome at all. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through uh, 30, and I mentioned this today at a, the homegoing service of uh, one of our members' uh, husbands. Uh, Matthews 11 and 28 through 30 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Why? Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Love lightens burdens, make them easy to carry. Jacob had to work seven years to win the woman he loved in Genesis chapter 29 and verse 20. And, 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 but the Bible tells us that they seemed to him a few days for he loved the father because of the love that he had for the woman's hand that he was working for. Perfecting love produces joyful obedience. When Jesus said it is finished, he was saying, I have been joyfully obedient even unto death. Jesus told his disciples that he would give his life as a ransom for many. Mark chapter uh, 10 verse 45 says, for even the son of man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. To remove evil from the world, he would suffer, taking evil on himself. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 through 11 uh, says, But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. The night before his death, Jesus prayed in a grove of olive trees called Gethsemane, which means olive press. Olives were crushed under a stone pillar to extract the oil. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 2 says, looking to Jesus, the author or the founder and perfecter of our or finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set down before him endured the cross, despising the shame and, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Words can't do justice to the intense agony that Jesus experienced in the olive grove as he anticipated the pain and suffering that he was about to undergo. Joyful obedience of the uh, wicked is but for a moment. That of the righteous is everlasting. The wicked rejoice, but their joy is simply like shooting off fireworks. They blaze away and seem to put the modest little stars in the sky to shame. 
but it's all just for a little while. Then they're all over, and even a moment, while the quiet stars are shining still. The light of the world was extinguished on the cross, on an old rugged cross, but early in the morning, three days later, that light shined in, of a glow that shines brighter than the noonday sun and shines forevermore throughout eternity. Jesus is the light of the world, and we are a reflection of his light. So let us learn from the word of God the, uh, the importance of joyfully obeying God, joyfully obeying God, not grudgingly. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would keep us in despair, guide us through the valley of the shadow of death, and use us in this dark world for your glory. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. Uh, don't forget to mask up uh, and then practice social distancing. Continue to do that and continue to wash your hands often. And just like Jacob was, the time passed fast. And our time of having to do this will pass quickly, even though it might be years as it was with uh, Jacob. But learn to joyfully do what is right for yourselves and for others in obedience to our Heavenly Father. And with that, I'm going to bid you farewell until the next time. I love you. Thank God for each of you for viewing these uh, uh, sermons and Bible studies from Mount Sinai and to Mount Sinai and for Mount Sinai and just hang in there. Take care. Bye-bye.